This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Hanam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a really great show today. Um, and tragically and unfortunately, the genocide in Gaza and in Palestine continues unabated today, with close to 20,000 Palestinian civilians being killed and murdered by the Israeli military. Close to 10,000 of those killed in this genocide have been children, and 70% in total are women and children. In addition to that, the starvation in Gaza continues very catastrophically. There are uh, significant and deep and life-threatening food shortages that continue uh, to plague Palestinians and the internally displaced in Gaza, and it does not look like there's going to be any immediate changes in sight. In another breaking development that just happened uh, within the last 24 hours, the Israeli military killed and murdered three of its own hostages that were coming out waving a white flag, and they were killed uh, by the Israeli military. What we, we are also hearing that the Biden administration is putting some, quote, pressure on the Israel, Israeli military to cut back, but that is a bogus kind of narrative coming from the White House, as we know, because on the ground in Gaza, in Palestine, there have been no changes. So before we get to some discussion of ongoing settler colonial violence in the West Bank, we're going to watch an interview that you did with Hatem Bazian, who is a professor at UC Berkeley in Ethnic Studies, talking about Israel's foreign ministry four-point plan coordinating with ADL, APAC, to muzzle and dismantle pro-Palestinian activism on college campuses. It's an amazing interview, Jamal. That's right. And of course, the major attack, uh, they've, they've been targeting uh, student justice for Palestine and Jewish voice for peace. Let, let's watch Dr. Bezian. Israel's genocide in Gaza has sparked outrage and spotlighted Israel's decades-long history of ethnic cleansing and occupation. Support for Palestinians is surging internationally with the younger generation mobilizing in record numbers on college campuses and social media. Israel's Foreign Minister Eli Cohen has a four-point plan to muzzle and dismantle pro-Palestinian activism both on campuses and in general. ADL, APAC, and other powerful inveterate pro-Israel advocacy groups in the United States are coordinating to implement it. A major tactic is what Dr. Hatem Bazian calls checkpoints in academia, which he describes as controlling and censoring information and opinions on campus to make sure that Israel keeps its prime position. One example is the shutting down chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine by different universities. Also making news are accusations of alleged anti-Semitism during pro-Palestinian protests on elite college campuses. It has also resulted in major donors withdrawing funds and calling for resignations of respective presidents. Today on Arab Talk, Dr. Bazian explains why these are meant as diversions from Israel's ongoing war crimes and ethnic cleansing in Gaza, as well as in the West Bank. He is the executive director of the Islamophobia Stud Islamophobia Studies Center, as well as professor at Zaytuna College and a lecturer in Middle Eastern languages and cultures and Asian American studies at UC Berkeley. He is the author of the book, Palestine, It is Something Colonial. Welcome back to Arab Talk, Hatem. Uh, uh, thank you, Jamal, and uh, it's good to be with you again. Hopefully we could uh, meet again in a better time, but this is the world we live in. That's right. So let's start by you giving us an overview of Students for Justice in Palestine and its success in raising awareness and mobilizing students about Israel's occupation and other uh, human rights violations. Well, uh, if we think about uh, currently SJB on uh, U.S. college campuses and possibly also some other countries, uh, close to 250 chapters and uh, uh, more so coming in different universities. And SJP uh, activists, student activists, uh, and those who are supporting them have been able to create possibly uh, one of the most uh, robust uh, grassroots uh, campus organizing 
<clears throat> since possibly uh, the anti-apartheid movement and also the uh, anti-Vietnam uh, war opposition. Uh, it's not only on campus, but on a national level. Uh, students have embraced uh, Palestine as a cause. Uh, and I do think that we have reached a tipping point uh, in the uh, capture uh, and uh, the impact of uh, people rallying around Palestine as the cause for social justice. And I do think that there are a number of um, uh, stop points, a number of uh, er arenas that have helped uh, the canvas become a, a focal point for Palestine uh, organizing. Uh, I do think that uh, Israel's uh, successive uh, attack on, attacks on Gaza, not only today, but people have a short memory, that Israel has pummeling Gaza uh, almost uh, every uh, other year, uh, beginning into even, even before the 2008 uh, in the uh, first uprising uh, that Israel carried a major campaign against Gaza. Uh, but more so 2008, 2010, 2012, 2014, 2018, 2021. So this resulted in the uh, Palestine being a constant issue because Israel continuously engaged in what's called mowing the lawn <clears throat> and literally attacking Gaza population. So that's one area. The second, I think, is very important why the as JP and the college campuses have become uh, such an important point, is that Netanyahu, in the last year of Obama's presidency, and as Obama began to negotiate the Iran deal, uh, Netanyahu uh, worked with the Republicans uh, to come to Washington uh, to speak into a joint uh, Congress uh, session to oppose a sitting president's policy. That's unprecedented. This is not a defense of Obama, but just to understand, Netanyahu made Israel a bipartisan issue, and also his belligerency, bombastic personality, uh, his attitude toward Obama, who was, for all intents and purposes, a celebrated figure, wrongly so, but again, uh, that was the issue. Followed immediately with the election of Trump, and both Netanyahu hugged Trump and Trump hugged Netanyahu with some of the extreme elements of Israel. That had an impact on the positioning of Palestine on college campuses. So the assault today, I would say it's a delayed, uh, not realization, but a delayed response to these failures of policies that also met Palestinian organizing. And lastly, I would add, uh, people don't take account of the Ferguson uh, protest and the emergence of Black Lives Matter and the killing and murder of George Floyd as also two important points for college campus organizing that resulted in Palestine becoming imprinted uh, on college landscape with students for justice in Palestine, uh, as well as Jewish Voice for Peace, canvas uh, segment becoming an important part. You compare uh, SGP's uh, robustness in mobilizing for Palestine to the level of that during the anti-apartheid movement against South Africa. Uh, can you give examples? Well, uh, one, if we think about the level of organization uh, across the U.S. Uh, during the anti-apartheid movement, especially in the later years, late 80s, uh, every campus uh, of national standing had an anti-apartheid uh, committee or an anti-apartheid organization. Students Against Apartheid, Students for Freedom and Justice in South Africa, uh, the anti-apartheid steering committees, all and uh, organized and campus organizations were all. So if we think about it, it's a similar time periodization that we're seeing. Uh, second is that uh, uh, SJP today is a cross-section of the campus population. Uh, 
uh, Palestinians, Arab, Muslims are not the majority across the country. They're majority in certain states. If you think maybe we talk about Chicago, Illinois, maybe in uh, Minnesota, New Jersey, uh, and some. But across the country, it's a cross-sectional movement where people are actually coalescing. Similar phenomena developed in relations to South Africa uh, and apartheid movement on college campuses. Uh, third, uh, that you have actually a resolutions that are being passed uh, in student governments or statements of support that are being issued uh, that are across all spectrum except administration level. So you have uh, student governments, you have student organizations, you have faculty groups. There's an emergence of a faculty for justice in Palestine that literally is issuing statements and putting this uh, also, the uh, the uh, level of uh, activism is comparable to apartheid South Africa in period of uh, the movement or toward the late 80s. Uh, fourth, that the movement have moved uh, in the SJP student uh, organizing for Palestine from only organizing events to actually taking on uh, civil disobedience, uh, uh, sitting in buildings, uh, 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 protesting in front of companies that are dealing with uh, uh, it supporting Israel. <clears throat> so that has shifted from only a discussion on Palestine to uh, what we call taking direct action, including civil disobedience. And we could see from the image and the, the pictures that across the board uh, that this is the case of uh, students taking uh, direct action in order for them to uh, get their point across. And then fifth is also combining this direct action with uh, uh, sanctions or not sanctions, but boycotting uh, products, companies, and taking that proactively. And we see the uh, response relative to uh, uh, Starbucks, where even outside, but also inside, there's actually one employee of uh, Pete's Coffee say we had had a record sales in our uh, Pete's coffee, uh, as, as compared to the increased uh, boycotts of uh, uh, Starbucks, you saw the response relative to Zara, but th that is also that the student population are combining this direct action. With it. Lastly, well, we see the phenomena of uh, uh, increased teachings, increased uh, engagement with Palestine. Campuses are bringing the old phenomena of a teaching that was very popular during the from the 60s, but also during the anti-apartheid movement, and that also captured the uh, the notions or the ideas that we are dealing with a phenomena distinct and different from uh, uh, previous periods relative to Palestine organizing campus. So that's. Those are nods of comparisons, and some might add others, but these are things that we are seeing. And may, I may also add uh, maybe the uh, uh, the support or the arrival of legal support uh, in uh, to support protesters, to support SJP, to support SJP and organization, whether the National Boys Guild, uh, Muslim Legal Fund of America, uh, Palestine Legal Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, even the ACLU. Uh, so we are seeing the phenomena that the legal community, likewise, are responding and bringing their legal uh, tools to uh, support and protect the activists on campus, something similar that happened uh, during uh, the later period of the anti-apartheid group. Right. Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, has a plan of action to squelch and delegitimize anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian activism in the United States. It's well known that Israel coordinates closely uh, with American partners. Uh, this plan is comprehensive. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the, uh, the plan that, uh, if I may uh, date a little bit earlier, there was uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel uh, uh, have uh, put a plan forward uh, back 2014 uh, and allocated massive resources at the time of a 30 million uh, to try to target pro-Palestine activists, uh, especially on college campuses, and uh, identify what they consider to be 
the top uh, targets. At the time, I was one of the top targets in this plan that included a an on-ground spy operation on my house, on my uh, family, as well as on campus. Uh, this is Project Butterfly. Uh, that the, even the FBI discovered that there was this operation when they were investigating uh, the Trump uh, campaign with Cambridge Analytica. And so there was a there's a long line of uh, trying to squelch uh, campus activism by deploying resources, including uh, sometimes uh, uh, operatives under the Hasbara network that are directly connected to the Israeli uh, government. This attempt to try to target the campuses has been an ongoing uh, uh, strategic concerns for uh, Israel, foreign ministry, but also all of the major organizations, uh, Zionist organizations in the United States, whether we speak about the ADL, AJC, JCRC, Zionist Organization of America, uh, in video, the presidents of major Jewish organizations, Jewish federations, in order for... Uh, to uh, derail, to demonize, to uh, uh, reshape the discourse about Israel. And this current plan has, again, many components. Uh, one is to try to use the legal access, uh, which is to uh, take legal actions against uh, activities and organizations in, uh, like, in the United States, like SJP, like Jewish Boy for Peace, like American Muslim for Palestine, like other the groups, uh, in order to literally uh, entangle them in legal actions, which creates what you call a, re a legal uh, cloud around them, in essence, to create a legal untouchable, untouchable, you know, the notion of being untouchable, relative to civil society. Uh, this is, in essence, you throw as much dirt, as much what you call legal theory garbage on the, on the way, and as such, you both drain the resources on the one hand, and the second, you create this uh, trail of uh, paperwork, trail of uh, um, uh, uh, unsubstantiated claims and uh, propaganda. And the fact that it's written on legal, uh, what you call, format, gives it a form of some type of legitimacy. So that's uh, some of the legal actions that uh, is taken place and pursuing it in, in that way. The second is what's called the economic access or the economic uh, direction, which is uh, to try to harm funding for pro-Palestine groups, uh, to try to identify donors to universities, uh, pressure the universities, which uh, was one of the cases relative to Penn State. Uh, the fact that a donor of $100 million uh, uh, was in the forefront of pressuring the university if the uh, uh, if that if the uh, university does not fire or uh, 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 the president does not step down, then the hundred million donations will be actually withdrawn, and legal action also was pursued in there. And uh, more importantly, is also to make sure that to promote economic sanctions against universities uh, that are receiving federal or state public funding. And I think this is one of the most important elements that we need to watch. Since the political elite in the United States already, uh, uh, what you call, uh, seems to be uh, acting as an advisor, if not the Secretary of State for Netanyahu, and therefore they're going to outdo themselves in this current period uh, to try to be of help to Israel and Netanyahu, considering we're coming into the 2024 election. Uh, and these are the funding, especially federal funding, Title VI, and other titles of the civil rights, including as well trying to create investigations of violation of the Civil Rights Act on college campuses, and thus to force the university to almost uh, uh, become the uh, arbiter of uh, pro-Palestine or Palestinian speech and activism, because now it actually uh, goes directly to their uh, uh, pocketbook relative to federal funding and state funding. So if my... Uh, uh, lens is there, I would say that all of these uh, Zionist organizations, including the academic attaché, the consulates, and Israeli embassy, are writing these uh, memos and these uh, policy recommendations uh, at the level of policy level and trying to force uh, this uh, economic 
um, intervention at the university level, and the university administration-wise will always will, uh, uh, bend backward to try to uh, fulfill some of this need. Uh, the third element is what's called naming and shaming, uh, to, which has been going on for some time, uh, publicized names of pro-Palestinian individuals, students and faculty and staff, uh, impact their employment uh, by, for these individuals. We already saw a number of students that they're, uh, especially in the law field, uh, their offers for employment were withdrawn. We saw some uh, individuals, uh, teachers and so on, been fired, uh, individuals in various capacities. Uh, and then we have a major element, uh, whether it's Canary Mission or ADL and so on, that are using uh, this campaign, including the sending of trucks with uh, individuals' names and faces, uh, both around campuses, but uh, dotsing them, the whole dotsing phenomena that is taking place as a way to try to tell if you are going to stand on Palestine, this is the consequences that you are going to face. And literally what we're telling to the American students, faculty, staff, and public is that you cannot stand against a foreign government, meaning Israel. And in here, both the U.S. government as well as U.S. campuses are either silent or if they do, they basically couch it in such a nonchalant type of terminology, allowing the continuation of uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. And then the last part is more of enlisting influencers uh, uh, to send influencers to U.S. campuses to coordinate with pro-Israel. Pa- paid paid uh, influencers, paid, we should say. Paid influencers, yeah, paid influencers, but also recruiting, which has been a disaster. Uh, they recruited some Arab uh, influencers uh, just a while back when the normalization campaign was underway uh, to try to put out content that basically... Uh, a tug on this normalization while also sh- uh, and, uh, trying to uh, demean, to speak ill of those who are standing for justice for the Palestinians. So that, in essence, is part of uh, the campaign and there are full press attempts. And this is setting aside the whole APAT strategy that is being pursued at the policy level with Congress and Senate with so many resolutions that are attempting to really... Uh, pull back the change in public opinion. Uh, so APAC and pro-Israel uh, discourses, they lost the debate in the United States and they lost the debate across the world. And now the only way for them to gain back this lost ground, which for me is irreversible, is by legislating, silencing, and muzzling people uh, in such a way that they will be able to continue to propagate uh, almost an un- inconsequential message of one, Israel has a right to defend itself, right, the one, and Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, That is no longer landing as a statement in the middle of unfolding genocide that is being uh, streamed live minute by minute, and people are literally witness to this unfolding genocide. I want to I, I want to give uh, our audience uh, the chronology of the campaign to shut down students uh, for justice uh, in Palestine. Uh, on October 11, uh, ADL and several other pro-Israel and Zionist groups circulated a letter calling to disband mm-hmm. chapters of SJP for its support for Hamas's action on October 7. At least that's what they were alleging. It demonizes the group with false interpretation of its words and accuses it of condoning atrocities by Hamas uh, that are false. Governor DeSantis uh, of Florida immediately orders Florida's state universities to disband the group. He expands the accusation without a shred of evidence to SJP being a terrorist organization. The letter the state uh, university chancellor Rodriguez sends out to universities stated it is a felony under Florida law to knowingly provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. Is this a textbook example of how Israel's game plan gets enacted? Well, that's the, again, that's the plan. Uh, uh, since Israel cannot argue its point, cannot debate its point, like uh, just, you know, just let's entertain ourselves for a minute. Uh, 
can you can anyone with uh, any standing defend Netanyahu? I, uh, speak about Netanyahu, how great a leader he is. Uh, what a you know, uh, what an inspirational, moral, ethical uh, individual he is. You just can't. It just even among uh, pro-Israel individuals, they will possibly speak about Netanyahu while holding their nose. Uh, relative. So Netanyahu as a commodity, as a product, is not defendable. Can you defend Ben Gavir? Can you defend Smokers? Can you defend the settlers? Can you defend the pogroms that are taking place? Uh, aside from maybe few who are uh, friends of the IDF uh, collective or some of the evangelicals who really are look, looking at millenarians, it's indefensible or undefensible at this point, indefensible, undefensible right at this point relative to this. Can you uh, defend that Israel does not uh, is actually pursuing peace? Uh, Israel says that they want every piece of Palestinian land. They are actually even the uh, Israeli uh, ambassador in, in the UK said there is no two state solution. Netanyahu does not want two state solution. Settlers don't want two state solution. Uh, everyone in there, including just yesterday, that some of a real estate agency in Israel is already putting a promos for buying and developing property front, uh, peace front property on Gaza, as we are witnessing genocide. So would you like to stand up and defense and defend this? The only thing that they could say is Hamas attacked us and now we need to kill everybody. I, is that a defensible position? Do you want to stand up and say that we are uh, mowing the lawn? What does mowing the lawn uh, stands for? Uh, how do you justify the killing right today by today's 92 journalists? Uh, what uh, uh, argument? Oh, they're taking what you call civilian, uh, they're having civilians as human shields, and that's why we need to actually drop a 2,000 bomb with a 500-yard radius of death. Is that the argument that you're going to stand for? Uh, and you're defending all kinds of uh, uh, killing just because, assuming that 2007, Gaza population voted for Hamas, and therefore each and every one of them is guilty, is that the logic that you're going by? By all means, go at it. Get get going and see. So the strategy right now, knowing they can't make any sound argument, and uh, knowing that the campus is our lost uh, terrain on, on principle, on moral, ethical principle, in intellectual basis of argument, the only way is to try to get the United States government, we already see states, and also possibly university president to use the anti-terrorism law, in particular the Patriot Act, to designate uh, SJP as ex expressing or extending material support. Now, that notion of material support is very uh, tricky in terms of as a as a as a law. And one is that if you extend any financial support to a designated terrorist organization or receive any financial support, that's one. The second, if you lend any type of support for their agenda, for their ideas, but that has to be that you're receiving instruction to be their, uh, to be their sports person, to advocate on their behalf and so on. So that's material support. So the Santos, the ADL, interestingly, is uh, coming with a new uh, theory. Uh, again, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt uh, never misses an opportunity to be racist and uh, what you call uh, 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 underhanded, is giving the theory that the fact that we have large number of protests in the United States, and these protests are defending the Palestinians, these Palestinians, uh, the defending of Palestinians is in essence defending Hamas, and as such, they constitute a conspiracy of material support. Right now, again, logic is in short supply in Washington, and since everybody is trying to run for election, that theory might be tested with some type of resolution or some type of a, uh, a, a strategy that might derail or try to entangle SJPs and other organizations in uh, legal action three, four, five years, in three, four to five years, in the whole of the ADL, the uh, APAC, and so on, will be able to delay the continued uh, successful advocacy for, for Palestine. So that's the hope of what this strategy is pursuing to use the, the Patriot Act as an instrument to shut down the First Amendment rights of people. So literally, it's an assault on First Amendment rights in the United States. It's an assault using the Patriot as an assault on free speech, using the Patriot Act as an assault on the right 
of freedom of association, uh, the basic of freedom of literally speaking on justice that we're paying for, meaning that our tax money is funding it, right? and uh, Greenblatt and others are trying to utilize the Patriot Act as a tool against the fundamental freedom, free speech, free freedom of association, First Amendment, and academic freedom on college campuses. So here is another thing. We're also uh, seeing a similar situation with elite colleges under attack for not confronting anti-Semitism, where the meaning from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is put forth as a call for genocide of Israelis and by extension, Jews. Israel and its supporters are focused on conflating rejection of Israel as anti-Semitic. Let's uh, dispel this once for all, this phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Well, uh, I wrote about that uh, Palestinians in historical Palestine are in various segments. In 1948, their citizens, their Israeli citizens, but not sovereign, uh, subject to uh, discrimination almost worse than Jim Crow laws. Uh, in the United States, they're first-class citizens subject to 65 discriminatory laws in Israel. Palestinians in Gaza are internationally dependent. They're stateless people, totally. They're internationally dependent population. They don't have their rights. Palestinians in the West Bank are under military rule. They're none, they have no right whatsoever. And the Palestinians in Jerusalem hold the Israeli ID, but they are not citizens of Israel. So, uh, from the river to the See, Palestine will be free, meaning Palestinians lack the basic freedom. Now, on the opposite end, uh, Yael uh, uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu's son, puts out a tweet, says that there is a state from the river to the sea that's free is Israel. And he puts the Israeli flag over all of historical Palestine. And if we recall, when Netanyahu went to speak at the UN General Assembly, he had a map. Uh, I, I know he's like... Um, entertains himself by drawing, so I don't know who drew the map for him, but he drew the map and Palestine was nowhere. Even occupied territories are completely erased and so on. So in here, uh, again, uh, our, uh, our colleague George Lakoff says, don't pick up an elephant. The strategy of Israel is to create these elephants and to re, uh, literally when I say don't think of an elephant, you think of an elephant, taking that as a rhetorical strategy or public relations strategy, you continue to throw. So from the river to the sea is the problem. Therefore, we need you calling for the annihilation of uh, uh, Israel and so on. And as such, this is a uh, anti-Semitism, and we need to actually restrict and demonize anyone that says it. But more importantly, anyone that puts it on social media has to be uh, removed. And uh, 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 Intifada is a call for annihilation of the of Israel. If you actually call for PDS, right, it's a annihilation of Israel. So all these theories is a very strategic, uh, you know, I need to credit uh, uh, our opponents in terms of the, uh, those who work on uh, public relations framing, is that they constantly put these uh, uh, elephants for people to uh, tell on. So while we are actually witnessing <coughs> the genocide of Palestinians, Oh, again, I'm sorry. Genocide is another term that you actually are tested and you... So, uh, Free Palestine, Palestine is Palestine also... Is the, <laughs> Free Palestine, you say Palestine. So all these are terms we have to understand. It's a public relations framing to make the problem something other than the center cause or center issue. We are witnessing an unfolding genocide. We're talking about now close to 10,000 children kids and children and babies that have been killed by massive bombardment that is indiscriminate. Uh, literally, uh, Israeli defense said we are aiming for destruction, not accuracy. Uh, over 50% or uh, the study of the bombs that Israel dropped are so-called dumb bombs. There is no such thing as guided uh, uh, bomb. 43% of the Gaza population are children. So literally, uh, the destruction is deliberate intentional systematic so instead of discussing this president of the university is uh the press uh, which leaves much to be desired as a press no longer investigative journalism all are running and making interviews and putting the microphone to ask you about the river to the sea intifada and so on well term 
there are children being bombed in there. There's 187 children per day are being killed by bombardment that we are paid for it. It's basically you speaking to a wall. CNN just two days ago managed to have what it put. Is it uh, Clarissa? I'm Clarissa, yeah, the, Clarissa. Cl Clarissa just made it together for a few hours, right? And went out. Uh, and they have been reporting on Palestine and not having somebody on the ground. Uh, like complete abdication of any standard of journalistic ethics uh, in this sense. So this is part of the strategy of really creating alternative routes to discussion. So the main issues of unfolding genocide, of death and destruction, of Israel's refusal to actually recognize Palestinians as people that have the right to justice, to freedom, uh, to uh, right to their homes, right to their land, those are questions that are an ass, and we begin to run after whatever the uh, Israeli uh, ministry, uh, foreign ministry is sending us as a framing, what the Israeli spokespeople are framing. We're seeing people strip of their clothes right there, which the Israeli press are putting out. I don't know what they were thinking. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they were thinking. Maybe they're thinking about to look at the bodies of Palestinians as something that enthralled them, that they put this actually in their TV to show the Palestinians being uh, uh, stripped of their clothes and lined up and rejected that these are all Hamas. Uh, uh, the world is watching your action, right? That this is a level of violation. I, you know, I thought that we have seen uh, violations of the four Geneva Convention in Afghanistan, in Iraq and so on, which was horrific. But Israel have taken the violation of the four Geneva Convention to unprecedented levels. The fact that hospitals have been attacked, the fact that schools have been, I don't know if you saw the pictures of an UNRWA school uh, that has been, uh, bombs were placed in it and the Israeli soldiers are sitting in there and bombing it and celebrating. This was no hostility, no threat whatsoever. This was an intentional war crime to have a United Nation facility not alone other facilities being attacked, the Shifa Hospital, uh, the Anglican uh, Lahni Hospital, the Nasser Hospital, all these hospitals being attacked, the, the attacks of journalists, the attack, the destruction of all of the universities, like you saw the uh, Al Azhar University of Gaza, completely demolished. Right? Mosques and uh, churches. The destruction of library, mosques and churches. So the violations of the poor Geneva are unprecedented. So knowing this, I need to credit, credit is due, the masterful uh, PR strategy uh, that is being fed to uh, people in Congress, in Senate, in uh, even at the uh, White House, and then across uh, our political media elite and universities, uh, is to go and basically censor people stating the facts uh, and uh, making almost completely obfuscating, covering, erasing the genocide that is taking place. After this period, there's going to be considerable study about the abdication of moral ethical uh, responsibility of individuals uh, that actually thought about uh, muzzling the voices while and the genocide was unfolding. And that's basically the only way I could explain this uh, attempt to try to problematize the statement rather than problematize the action of a foreign state that is engaging in genocide while we're paying for it and supporting it to the help. Listen, the United States still supports the uh, assault, the genocide in in Gaza, and uh, except for like recently, the administration says that it, they've spoken to or Biden spoken to Netanyahu, telling him to take it easy on on people. And then what we saw. Just uh, yesterday, that's I, to me the biggest proof of how the the way these Israeli soldiers have been trained is that they shot their own uh, former hostages and they were dressed and well, half naked, carrying a white flag, and and that's right. that's the policy. They just went, shot them, and killed them. In, uh, you know, and and right. they were forced to admit that uh, because bef in, initially they were saying that they. Uh, rescued some dead hostages and so forth. And they changed their story because they're worried that Hamas has a, a video of the, in, the interaction. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I, I no longer hear anything from this president. Uh, that president has no moral, ethical standing left. Uh, it is complicit in an outside, uh, saying to Netanyahu to ease up and to wind down the operation, giving him until the beginning of the year, January, meaning 20, the time that he said these statements, so about 25 days more, uh, while trying to send uh, so-called humanitarian supplies, he's sending the bombs. And the third shipment of uh, what you call uh, major bombs that have been sent to Israel, 14,000 in new uh, shells for uh, the uh, uh, for the tanks. There have been sold another 105 million emergency funding, emergency uh, sending of weapons. Uh, you cannot be on both sides, on one hand, on uh, trying to support civilians, and at the same time supporting the unfolding and military enablement of a genocide uh, that is taking place. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, staff in the White House, interns in the White House, interns in the State Department, uh, the staff members have been actually uh, raising their voices in opposition to what is taking place. And there are a number of countries already have filed and put uh, uh, international criminal court uh, complaints of genocide that is occurring. After this uh, period, again, um, hopefully it comes sooner than later, uh, there will be a lot of not, a large number of people that will have to answer uh, for the genocide that have taken place uh, in front of our eyes. I, I, I include also some of the Arab countries. Uh, their complicity is there, so I don't want to be appearing to be uh, not uh, what you call uh, inclusive of the critique. I think Egypt has played, Egyptian government in particular, have played a deplorable role in in this uh, in this uh, period, uh, not opening the uh, the border for supplies to come in, not standing up for Israel, even though Israel bombed the Egyptian border at least on three separate occasions. Uh, they are actually the ones that are locking the the door from their side. Again, I understand your the position of not wanting the Palestinians rightly so to be uh, pushed to the Zaina, but that not the only position uh, that should be taken, that the Egyptian government should insist on its sovereignty of the border with uh, Rafah and open the border for all supplies to come in. And if Israel wants to bomb them, then what is the position of a state that cannot act uh, in support of a population that is facing dire consequences? Egypt is a signatory to the Four Geneva Convention, is signatory to the Convention on Genocide, and it bears legal responsibility to act uh, in such matter. But they opted not, and they still, uh, even as we speak, uh, the United States wants to negotiate with them to possibly uh, take Palestinians out into uh, the Sinai. And uh, when Biden visited, uh, he was attempting to sign a deal. Uh, also, the position of Jordan is untenable and has to be critiqued in terms of their uh, stand and how they uh, are facilitating or almost uh, non, uh, non-acting non relative to Palestine, considering 70% of Jordanian population is Palestinian. And aside from letters of condemnation and allowing some protests to take place, there is almost ineffective uh, support. Uh, the uh, Gulf oil and gas producing countries um, have not actually used any of their uh, powers uh, it's literally the single most important commodity around the globe. And yet it has not been utilized. Even a press release of a possibility of utilization will actually uh, have an effect. So uh, the Palestinians are left alone to face a genocide uh, while uh, being streamed live to everyone. I, I'm, I don't know, aside from the Israelis themselves and maybe Biden in the White House, uh, that they don't see what is occurring. Uh, uh, almost everybody is just who has the capacity to act is choosing to actually uh, not to act because they are still calculating their singular narrow political uh, agendas. And I think that is the utter uh, failure and collapse of moral ethical compass that we're seeing it in the Arab and Muslim world simultaneously. You're absolutely right on this. Uh... On a positive note, uh, the masses are with Palestinians, as we have seen uh, all the demonstrations across the, gro- the globe. People are pushing back. Uh, they're, they're not uh, 
buying into these um, lies that Israel puts out there and is repeated by American politicians. You have SJP is suing DeSantis for violating its freedom of speech at Columbia University after both the Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace were suspended. 80 students groups working towards a goal of collective liberation have reactivated the Columbia University Apartheid Divest Coalition. Are you encouraged by this? Well, I'm encouraged that the world is no longer accepting uh, Israel lies, propaganda, Hasbara, their uh, uh, use of all types of methods and processes to demonize the Palestinians and almost erase them. Uh, the rate of response globally is unprecedented, uh, meaning that the world is beginning to actually say there is only one standard uh, that have to apply to everyone. There is nobody above the law. Uh, Israel is not exceptional. There is no Israel exceptionalism. There is no Zionism exceptionalism. There is no American exceptionalism. There is one standard and one legal framing that has to apply for all. And I do think I'm very uh, optimistically guarded, but very optimistic in the sense uh, that we are seeing some results. Uh, I'm comforted to see uh, Colombia acting, uh, Bolivia acting, uh, Brazil acting, um, uh, um, uh, to say South Africa acting, uh, to see uh, Belgium is actually you know, acting, to see Norway, to see uh, Spain, Barcelona, Real Madrid, and so on, are all acting. It definitely shows that the momentum of uh, critiquing and taking Israel to that is underway. I do say that the fear uh, uh, barrier had collapsed. Uh, there was a considerable fear of taking upon Israel uh, directly and head on. And I do think that it's taken place. Uh, it's it, it just, you could see it from the UN vote uh, on Article 377A uh, that calls for a ceasefire. 153 countries voted uh, for, only 10 countries that voted against. And most of those who voted against are uh, literally a small cluster uh, of countries, uh, possibly also only the United States, Israel, and Paraguay, that would be seen as major players. But in essence, the world global community uh, is standing for and calling for Palestine. So that actually shows that the transformation that has been cumulative over a 30-year period is actually uh, coming to this uh, threshold, and I do believe that the tipping point has been has arrived, and it's no longer possible to reconstitute the fear barrier one on the one hand and reconstitute the public standing image. And no matter what happened in the few next days or months in Gaza, and whether Israel wins the war, wins the battle or not in relation to Gaza, I do feel, I do assert that Israel has lost the war, not in terms of physical battle, but the war at a global level that Israel is no longer seen as a positive, good citizen within the global community. It has been tagged before that, or it's been identified in a standing as an apartheid state. Now that has been added to it, an apartheid state that has committed the genocide that everybody is witnessing. And I do think that people are not realizing what is occurring, that this is a genocide that people are witnessing minute by minute, uh, that there, it actually the social media has captured this in ways that are unprecedented uh, and that we have to see uh, these consequences. So again, the apartheid, all of the human rights organizations have uh, uh, spoken about and issued reports on Israel being an apartheid state whether it's uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission, uh, Committee, Beth Salem, al haq So that is no longer debatable, even among uh, pol politicians in Israel, that that term has been what you call, even though they dredge it, it's there. And now we're dealing with the actual uh, genocide. So in this sense, the fear is no longer there, and the fact that Israel, in, in terms of its standing globally, is no longer seen as a good citizen in a 
Uh, in a landscape that, in essence, it has some what you call unsavvy, unsavvy character, it has some states that don't act uh, appropriately. But in general, Israel stands right now in a class of its own uh, because of its conduct relative to uh, Gaza and Palestine. This is what I'm saying. This is at a time where Russia is invading and had committed uh, all kinds of uh, uh, war crimes in relations to Ukraine, whether people debate that or not, that to see that Israel is actually have outdone itself relative to Russia in real time as Zelensky is coming around the, uh, Washington to try to get more support, that this is the phenomenon that, that we're experiencing, and I don't think it's a reversible phenomenon. And that's, again, to say that freedom for Palestinians is closer than what we think, because at the end of the day, Israel still has to come and recognize that that six and a half to seven million Palestinians are not going anywhere. And Ben Gavir, Monday morning, uh, illogical, logical quarterbacking uh, and small fresh, uh, what you call uh, midnight dreams of what he wants in terms of greater Israel is untenable. And unless you want to commit at seven million people to genocide, you know, their dream is to push the Palestinians out. That's again is a person that had no thought whatsoever. And you could use Amalek as a framing as a biblical framing, and that's, you would think, you would think that somebody would talk to Netanyahu, you know, somebody from PR, PR company, somebody that had what you call, been advertising Coca-Cola or nutritious product, you tell him that using Amalek as a way to speak about the Palestinian might not be the good framing to try to get the biblical narrative in there. Why don't you choose another narrative that speaks, puts you as an advocate of higher magnitude, rather puts you a person that is actually seeking and committing genocide, and you think that you actually are having the moral high ground. Uh, for me, it's like literally, the myth, I have never seen the type of misstepping, the type of blundering, the type of almost uh, rolling down the hill without a stop, without anybody actually stopping to think that I have witnessed in the past 70 days relative to Israeli political elite. It's completely, completely out of touch. And even if they apply for a literally a startup position on a public relations front, they are no longer hireable. They actually speak positively, look at the mirror and they say, oh, I'm beautiful. Maybe everybody would say I'm beautiful. It's no longer registry and people are seeing it for what it is. And that's again, if you want to say it's optimistically so, because this is the consequences total disregard to the world community and taking them for granted. Dr. Hatem Bazian, uh, thank you for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. That's the voice in the face of Dr. Hatem Bazian, a professor at UC Berkeley in Ethnic Studies, giving a very compelling analysis of how the pro-Israel groups, specifically the ADL and APAC, in coordination with the Hasbara campaigners uh, in Israel, continue to muzzle and crack down on pro-Palestinian speech, specifically SJP Jamal and Jewish Voices for Peace. It's a very chilling, chilling story, Jamal. It's absolutely very chilling. And, you know, we, we've reported on this topic many times, talking about how they target professors on campus, but now they're right. going after student groups. And, uh, you know, they've forced a couple of universities basically to to shut down these chapters. Uh, they've been challenged in Florida, for example, and I think they're going to lose because this is an attack on the First Amendment and a, an attack on... Imagine, this is... If, if you can't say anything on college campus, if you cannot debate any topic and then and, and we know what happened during uh, apartheid South Africa. And now we have a similar si situation with apartheid Israel in addition to a whole genocide ongoing. And you want to muzzle these student groups from basically protesting what's going on in Gaza and protesting uh, human rights violations and injustice. Well, Jamal, that's exactly right. And we're going to continue to follow that story because this is not going to go away anytime soon. I also want to bring a, a really interesting um, article to light to our viewers and listeners that came out in The Guardian on Friday, December 15th. Uh, you should take a look at it. And it exposes the kind of 
uh, settler colonial violence that's occurring and has occurred in the West Bank and in Jerusalem for decades now, since 1967. But the ramping up of that settler colonial violence by the illegal colonial settlers in the West Bank and in Jerusalem, um, this article came out on Friday by The Guardian, really exposing a couple of elements which were um, really disturbing. I mean, again, you and I have been reporting on it, but it's starting to make some progress in getting out there in other media outlets. This particular article uh, documented that the overwhelming majority of settler violence appears to be coming from American settlers who are coming and settling and stealing Palestinian land in the West Bank and in Jerusalem right now. There are some estimates that anywhere from 60 to 100,000 of the illegal colonial settlers in the West Bank and Jerusalem are American citizens who are responsible for the majority of the violence that's being carried out uh, against Palestinians. It's a very compelling article. It talks about how these illegal colonial settlers, who are Americans, let's keep that in mind, are having a deep and enduring influence on the Israeli political system and uh, influencing Benjamin Netanyahu, as we know and as we've talked about, and are a key component of his far-right extremist uh, government right now. It's a very compelling read. And uh, we are going to encourage our viewers and listeners to take a look at it. Yeah, it's uh, it's in the Guardian, and it's a very it's a very important article, as you said. And this comes after uh, Secretary Anthony uh, Blinken said that uh, the Washington is issuing a ban on travel to the U.S. Uh, by D- extremist, don't believe it. extremist Jewish settlers. But then you know this is when when Israel when the United States had now basically given Israel a visa waiver. And then how can you ban American citizens from coming? So so in, in a way, it's a hint, like say, we're going to ban these extremist Jewish settlers from coming into the United States. But when you have 60 to 100,000 of them who are U.S. citizens, what do you do about this? You, you can't ban them, Jamal. That's why you can never really believe what the Biden administration or Antony Blinken says about Palestine. It's a complete kind of... Uh, a waving of the hands and covering of the reality. They can't ban American citizens, obviously. And and the, the thing that's important about this Guardian article is that the core settler violence is coming from American citizens. And we want to ask the Biden and, Blink- and Biden administration and Blinken State Department, what are you going to do about attacks on American citizens, by American citizens, in an illegal colonial settlement uh, in the West Bank? It's, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling that the American, this Biden administration and the American uh, State Department are doing nothing to protect U.S. citizens and Palestinians who also happen to be American citizens in the West Bank. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download the latest shows, and we'll speak to you next week. See you next week.